There you go. Yeah, so we're one of the, one of the very few groups around that takes a holistic um, outlook on the environment here. We do research, a lot of cutting edge. We let that inform our advocacy often. Usually we are a land trust, so we've protected lots of land around the bay, uh, focus being on wildlife habitat, viable wildlife habitat, and we educate and we educate the adults uh, and kids through something like this. Or we do some active, a lot of active education with the kids in schools and some in school and a couple of big outside days. Two slides of some different uh, things we've been doing over the years. A uh, really neat current study it took four years, or three, uh, took actually four years, but uh, catching tides at uh, high river flows and high flow, low flow, medium flows. Uh, that's all on the website. You can see animations of how things move around in the bay. It's very, very informing to how the bay works and what might happen to it if um, there are oil spills or too much sewage or things like that going on. I've uh, done some invasive species. Uh, I'm thinking of that tonight. Uh, my personal view is not to do too much with them unless you have a discrete stand because the, that horse is out of the barn. This was the only Phragmites stand on the bay, and we actually made a big effort on that and, and took care of it and just now occasionally tune that up. Um, do work with eagles, I long, long, many years worth of eagle surveys around the bay, sort of from here to Auburn, up to over to Augusta and, and back down, um, cage mussels to look at contaminants, um, archaeology. And a lot of our advocacy work revolves around fish passage and uh, pesticides, herbicides, and stuff like that. Doing a lot of work with PFAS now, particularly on the, the former Naval Air Station. Um, but also I've kind of done a lower watershed survey first of its kind. And then again, working with the kids, getting them out, getting them outside, having fun and and getting them dirty. The muddier the better. And again, focus on viable wildlife habitat with our with our land protection. And you can see maps about this stuff and find out a lot more on our website. And the cyberay, the part that Martin doesn't really do. Stan Moody manages for us is sort of an electronic library. There's a lot of technical information, peer review papers, research, things like that there. If uh, you like the presentation tonight and want to share it with anybody afterwards, uh, Martin should have it up on, online within a few days. And you can go down on our homepage on the right side down to education, and you'll see a speaker series video uh, link here. And that goes year by year. We've got about 10 years or so. Uh, of, of the 27 years uh, recorded, and you, you'll get an event page describing the event. And down at the bottom is a YouTube uh, thing of the recorded. And here's the series for this year, a couple more coming up um, uh, next month. Uh, bald eagles, uh, Chris DeSorbo is a good friend and biologist, um, been working on raptors for many, 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 yeah, many, many years, and it should be, should be really interesting. And here we are. Um, uh, Dr. Hillary Peterson is the Integrated uh, Pest Management Specialist at the Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. I should say the main department, uh, if that's not obvious. Um, <laughs> and that's part of the Plant Health Program. Um, Hillary grew up in Brunswick, and, and she got her BS in biology at the University of Maine, and then her PhD in entomology at Penn State. She has spent time working with invasive species and biocontrol in several agroecosystems, including berries, tree fruit, and corn. And Hillary recently moved back to Brunswick and happy as a clam to be back in uh, her home community. And I'm going to just ask Hillary to start, which I guess she was going to do anyway, with telling us a, a little bit about how she got into entomology and ended up where she is now. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Hillary, and we'll go from there. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. All right, let's get this going. Can everybody see that? Yes. All right, fantastic. Great, well, thank you so much again for the introduction. I'm so happy to be here tonight to share about this research. A little bit about my background. So as Ed said, I grew up here in Brunswick. Um, I went up to the University of Maine to do my degree in biology with a concentration in ecology, 
while I was there, I was super lucky and I got to work every year in Dr. Frank Drummond's lab, who was an entomologist and worked there for a long time. While I was in his lab, I got to work in research in bees. And also I was there the first year that spotted wing drosophila, who we'll be talking about today, showed up. So I was rearing colonies of that my freshman year of college and excited about it then. Um, <clears throat> I also in the summertime worked for Dr. Ellie Grodin and her graduate student, Caitlin O'Donnell on winter moth, which is an invasive moth around this area. Um, we were down in Harpswell. After UMaine, I went down to Pennsylvania and there are, if you can't believe it, many, many tracks in entomology. You can go many different routes and I wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. So I spent some time working in labs before started grad school. I did some corn integrated pest management. Um, and then through a crazy turn of events, including a lot of support from the Maine Entomological Society, I actually had the opportunity to do an internship at the Smithsonian. Um, while I was there, I learned how to identify these little teeny tiny sesame seed to rice sized parasitoids um, under the really the world specialist in those categories. Um, I was looking at samples I had collected for my honors thesis at UMaine and taking those IDs a little further. Then I started my PhD in Dr. Craig Grachek's lab um, down at the Penn State Fruit Research and Extension Center. Uh, during that, I looked at natural enemies and parasitoids, so predators and parasitoids of the invasive brown marmorated stink bug in tree fruit. That species is a huge problem down there. Once I finished up there, I moved back up to Maine and did some different jobs here and there and was super lucky to get to take on the role as the president of the Maine Entomological Society, which I still do. In fact, I'm going to be running a webinar tomorrow night um, for MES, so if you're interested, check out our website. And then I got my dream job as the Integrated Pest Management or IPM specialist uh, with the Maine Department of Agriculture, Conservation, Forestry. So if you haven't heard of IPM before, it is a holistic approach to pest management that really tries to use as big of a toolbox as possible to deal with pests through understanding the biology. So what some of those steps look like are, first of all, if you've got a pest issue, you need to know what species it is. So proper identification. And then when it comes to any ecosystem, agro ecosystem, your home, it's really important to set things up for success. So prevention is a huge piece. So through understanding what pests might be there, knowing what you need to do to prevent it. Monitoring and record keeping are really important. So if you have a pest issue, keeping track of when you saw it, where you saw it, what those conditions were, and having a system so that you can revisit that on an annual basis so you know what to look for and what, to, what worked and what didn't. Action thresholds is this really neat idea. Um, it started in agriculture where you don't treat for a pest until it meets something called the economic threshold. So that's the point at which, um, you know, the damage is going to cost more than treating for it. But this idea of action thresholds, I love to educate everybody on because I think a lot of people just see an insect and automatically assume it's a pest. Um, and, you know, most of the time an insect isn't a pest. So kind of just taking a moment to think about the context and is it really necessary to have inputs to deal with a pest that might not actually be a problem. And then finally, a piece of the toolbox is biological and pesticide control as needed. And it's always dynamic and flexible as those methods change. And IPM is really, should be the standard um, and is across many institutions. Um, the USDA has the, uh, the National Roadmap for IPM. We have a Northeast IPM Center. And DACF and UMaine Cooperative Extension both spend a lot of time educating and doing research to try to move things forward. So today we're going to be talking about biocontrol. So what is biocontrol? Well, it's when you have an organism that you're using to control another organism, and there's lots of different types. So first of all, you have insects or other non-insect arthropods serving as biocontrol agents. So you can have predators like this rove beetle, who's a generalist. You can have parasitoids if you haven't ever heard of a parasitoid, and maybe you've seen the movie Alien, they have a similar life history. Um, adults lay their eggs into other organisms. There are parasitoids that lay their eggs in the eggs of other insects, in the bodies of other insects, and lots of other creative things. Um, but what they do ultimately is kill their host. 
There are also entoma pathogens like fungi, nematodes, and bacteria and viruses. And across the whole spectrum of biocontrol, things can be generalists. So like this rove beetle or ants that might feed on lots and lots of different organisms or specialists. There are organisms that only feed on one other organism. And there's a whole gradient. So you might have um, a parasitoid that only attacks organisms within a family or a genus. Um, it can get really specialist or it can be generalist. There's also three types of biocontrol. So the first is conservation. So this is the idea of setting your landscape up to support the natural enemies that are already there and doing the work for you. Then there's augmentative biocontrol. And typically this is gonna be happening in an indoor setting like greenhouses, although sometimes it's outside. Um, and so this is where you're purchasing large amounts of a species and releasing it to basically act sort of as a pesticide for you. So um, th I think augmentative biocontrol is really awesome. And then finally, classical biocontrol. So this is typically when you have an invasive species that is causing a huge problem. And so folks will go back to the native range. And if you don't know a lot about invasive species biology, what happens is, is when an invasive species comes to a new location, it's released from its natural enemies. And so populations can explode without that natural control. So folks will go back to the native range of that invasive species so they can figure out, okay, well, why isn't it exploding here? And then they look for something that is a specialist. Remember I talked generalist to specialist. They try to find something that is a specialist on that species to bring and be in quarantine and release. And we'll talk a little more about the regulations there. So today we're gonna to be talking about classical biocontrol and we're gonna be talking about two different species. I am a very lucky entomologist because I got to be a part of two species releases of biocontrol. That's pretty much the dream. <laughs> so we'll be talking about a predator today, actually a herbivore, so I guess a plant predator, um, Hypena opulentia. You can see in that photo, it's nestled in that chewed up leaf that it ate and then a teeny tiny parasitoid. If you haven't picked it up yet, that photo, it looks like it's you know sitting on the earth or something, that's a blueberry. So these are small. One thing I wanna emphasize before moving forward though, is that biocontrol is not a silver bullet. And really there really never are just one, you know, there's not really a one silver bullet when we're talking about pest management. This is why we emphasize the whole IPM toolbox because, you know, Pesticides, for example, if you use them too much, especially just one type in one area, there can be resistance that develops. So biocontrol is something that's going to reduce the pest pressure when it works. And this can help to restore some balance and reduce the needs for other inputs. Another important thing to know about biocontrol is it is slow. It can take a really long time, but ultimately why it's so exciting is if it works and it starts the population start picking up, then you get the little biocontrol agents going out into the areas like the woods sometimes where we're not treating in the first place and helping to reduce that population in areas where we don't even know it is or we can't find. And having this toolbox and having anything to help is really great because many systems, here's an example here, this slide from Dr. Philip Fanning, who he is at UMaine, he replaced Dr. Frank Drummond when he retired. Um, this is just showing the um, blueberries over the season and all the different pests that blueberry growers need to think about. So we're just talking about one pest today, spotted wing drosophila, but this is everything they have to keep track of and control. And so having anything to reduce pest pressure for growers is great. So I'm sure that some of you sitting there are kind of having a red alert going off in your head, like, oh my gosh, we're gonna be bringing something and what are the unintended consequences? Um, in the past, 100, 200 year, or 100, 150 years ago, biocontrol wasn't regulated and there were a lot of mistakes, but things are really, really, um, there's a real complicated compliance process now. Um, so starting at the USDA APHIS level, there are three large steps that are broken down to many, many steps. So uh, first there needs to be a petition to release a novel agent. 
and that has to comply with the Endangered Species Act and the National Environmental Policy Act. Then there are seven steps to include in this petition. And then there's an environmental comp uh, compliance process. And I'm going to skip through all of these details because we don't have a lot of time tonight and I made a lot of slides. Um, but if you watch this again, you can feel free to pause here and read through these. So once the national level, yep. Excuse me, Kelly, I'm not sure you said it earlier, but you just mentioned APHIS and it's here. Could you just say what APHIS stands for? Yes, the Animal Plant Health Inspection Service. Okay, thank you. So once that is all done, then there's a second set of steps in the state of Maine as well. Um, so the first is that, you know, if someone just wanted to release something, there's a slight chance that it's on already on the Maine unrestricted list with the inland fisheries and wildlife, although most likely not. Um, so then a permit needs to be gotten from APHIS in Maine. And then there needs to be additionally a permit from the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. So you have to go through a lot of steps for approval for all of this. And there's a very, very large amount of research that I'll talk a little bit about that goes into this approval from APHIS. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about two different biocontrol opportunities in Maine that I got to take a part of. And we're gonna start with blueberries. So the first, project is Ganaspis brasiliensis as a classical biocontrol agent of spotted wing drosophila or drosophila suzukii. So if you haven't heard of spotted wing drosophila or sometimes SWD, um, this is an invasive species that's native to southeastern China, North and South Korea, Korea and southern Japan, which found its way to Maine in 2011. This species is a major concern to Maine agriculture, including wild blueberries, high bush blueberries, day neutral strawberries, and fall raspberries. But on top of that, it can also feed on so many different other species of berries. And so what the problem is, is that it will come and it will develop on berries that are cultivated but it can also develop on lots of different species of wild fruit. So it can hop back and forth between that wild fruit when it's ripe and then the cultivated fruit as well. They're identified, the females are identified through looking at this ovipositor, which is the egg laying structure, which is sawtoothed. And the reason why these flies have these sawtoothed ovipositors is that they actually lay their eggs in fresh fruit. So they need to saw into that flesh. And then the male flies sometimes have spots on their wings, not 100% of the time though. And so this graphic just shows some photos of a uh, berry with some larva and then some pupa. And as I showed before with that blueberry slide with all the pests, there has been a lot of complexity when it comes to this blueberry system and the research that's been done to try to figure out how to incorporate spotted wing drosophila management into IPM. So that can include chemical practices like different adjuvants and sprays, both organic and conventional, cultural practices like weed mats. So when the pupa drop out of the fruit, they land on these mats instead of being able to go into the soil and different biolog biological practices like biocontrol. So I mentioned that really cool piece where somebody gets to travel across the world to figure out what's going on in the native range. And lots and lots of work went into this. These are slides from uh, Dr. Kent Dane, who's done a lot of work on this. And you can see all the different folks across the bottom that are a part of this research. Um, so when they went over to its native range, they found 19 different parasitoid species that are known to attack the spotted wing drosophila. And they selected three that were the three most, um, the three species that accounted for 85.7% of the larval parasitoids that emerged. So they took these three species into quarantine to study to see, well, are they generalists or are they specialists? So we have a Fidgetidae, so a Gnapsis species, a different species of Fidgetidae, the Leptopolina, and then a Burconidae, Asobera. So what they wanted to make sure was that if one of these was chosen to be released into United States, it wouldn't have unintended consequences by attacking a bunch of other Drosophila and disrupting the ecosystem. 
So when they did all, see all these different little teeny italicized scientific names here, these are all the different Drosophilid species that were tested. And as you can see, Asabera attacked all these different ones with bars here. These are the number of offspring per female after 24 hours exposure period. And then Leptopolina attacked quite a few less. And then finally, they were pretty happy to see that Ganaspis only attacked Drosophila suzukii, the spotted winged Drosophila, and its two closely related cousins. And then occasionally would go after one more species. But this was clearly the strain and the species to use that attacked everything the least amount. And again, as I mentioned before, when we're talking about biocontrol, it's not an eradication most of the time. It's really that as the population of that biocontrol agent increases, there'll be sort of this balance and this lower amount of the spotted wing Drosophila as this species is controlling it. And I have a lot to share tonight, so I can't delve much deeper into the history of that. But this webinar, I just watched it. It was just, just on February 7th. It gave such a good background of this really cool process of going and figuring out um, you know, everything about which parasitoids to use and all the different trials of releases and things like that. So if you just have like a smartphone or um, take a photo of this QR code, you can click that later. That webinar is also free online. Highly recommend it. So Philip Fanning and his lab did everything through that whole permit process I talked about. And in 2021, I believe, were approved for the next year to release. It may have been 2022. I might get my years mixed up. I think it was 2021. And in, yeah, so it was 2021, they were approved for releases in 2022. So in 2022, they released 4,800 Ganapsis brasiliensis um, across four sites. And so they released them and then did the work to try to kind of recover them. And then they had a big surprise. Um, what they actually recovered were Leptolema, oh my gosh, Leptolema to Japonica. So I'm gonna go back a couple of slides. That's this species. Um, and so this isn't the first time in biocontrol history that if you think of it, uh, the fly came here, got here on its own. Sometimes the parasitoids find their way here too. So because no one was doing releases, nobody was really looking to see what was going on. So they released Ganapsis and then Leptopolina was actually there. So that was interesting. And we'll have some more for that story as I go through this presentation, um, but pretty interesting. And so this is where I had the opportunity to step in. So um, I applied for some funding to be a part of this and I kind of call myself a, an extra arm on their program's already big project where I just wanted to kind of extend and help release in some locations in you know, more Southern Maine. So the two big objectives of the study were to survey berry farms in Southern Maine for wild spotted wing Drosophila parasitoid populations. So what's already here now that we know that we have Leptopolina, is it, is it in Southern Maine as well? And then to be a part of releasing at two berry operations and comparing that kind of recap recapture with spotted wing Drosophila populations at each location. So we had one, up, all of the farms that we were at were operating berry farms, growing high bush blueberries and raspberries. We had a site in Mechanic Falls, a site in Bodenham, and a site in Wells. And we used um, different methods. So I'm gonna go through each one of those. So at each location, we monitored the spotted wing Drosophila population. Those were monitored on a weekly basis from July 7th through November 1st, 2023. Um, Dr. David Hanley of Humane Extension, who's at Highmore Farm, he had his scouts do this surveying throughout the whole summer. And so you survey for these by having these monitoring cups. Um, they're baited with about four ounces of an apple cider vinegar, alcohol, and tween blend. And then floating in that is a vial with a mix of water, sugar, and yeast. And so they'd collect those on a weekly basis and then count all the male and female spotted wing Drosophila. As the season went on towards the end of the season, they also started thinking it looked like there was some parasitoids in there. So they also collected all those parasitoids and sent them up to be identified by Dr. Philip Fanning's grad student, Ben. 
So the next is uh, the next method that we used was sentinel blueberries. And so what Philip's lab does is they take blueberries from the store. He has some funny stories of the people at Hannaford giving him a funny look with his hundreds of boxes of blueberries he's buying. Um, but they take store-bought blueberries and then infest them with the spotted wing drosophila that they keep in colonies in the lab. And then these get placed in the field in Delta traps. I'll show a photo of that on the next slide. Um, along the edge of the woods. Those stay in the field from four to seven days, and then they're brought back to the lab and reared to see what comes out. So it's sort of trying to mimic what's going on on the plants um, with infested berries that the parasitoids would be like, ooh, I can go parasitize this, and then you see what comes out. So when they're in the field, we use these delta traps, um, which are kind of borrowed from some different uh, tree fruit um, IPM methods, and we have those berries in there, protects them from the rain, um, and then you can just leave these all summer out so you have the berries every time you do this at the same time, at the same spot. Um, and we did this uh, three times over the summer. Next were wild fruit collections. So on a weekly basis, we'd go and visit the sites and look along the wooded line for any wild fruit different species of wild berries and collect those and bring them and rear them just the same in the lab. So we looked for those from 7-3 um, uh, through September 25th. And depending on the size of fruit, we'd either collect five to 10 larger fruits like high bush blueberry or blackberry or 15 to 20 smaller fruits like honeysuckle berries. And then again, those were placed in reared for at least 31 days to see if any parasitoids came out. And then finally, we did releases. And so Ganapsis brasiliensis, which were reared in Phillips lab, were released at, on um, August 1st. And at each site, 150 males and 150 females were released. So again, just for um, <laughs> this photo of me holding this vial here shows just how teeny tiny these little parasitoids are. Technically, parasitoids are wasps. But I try to never say that. I never say wasps when I'm talking to people because the first thing that pops up in their head are yellow jackets. And I've had a lot of panic when I'm like, oh, I'm releasing wasps. Like, oh my gosh, please don't. Um, so these parasitoids that were released were four to seven days old and they were housed in these Drosophila vials. They had some honey water and some damp paper towels. And so when we put them in the field, we put them in those same Delta traps, the same locations and just took the little foam plug out and that was it. Put them in, took the foam plug out and we were done for the day. We then went back and took those, um, kind of checked out to make sure that we didn't have any like mass deaths of the parasitoids or anything like that. Uh, took those right back out and that was that. So we did that one release. So the next few slides are gonna show um, each slide is one of the release locations. So we're gonna start with Mechanic Falls. I'm going to first talk about the spotted wing drosophila populations over the season. So if you see here on the um, Y axis, we have the number of spotted wing drosophila detected, zero to 1,000. And then we have the date weekly. And the solid line are the males and the dotted line are the females. So in Mechanic Falls, the population started to rise around um, July 24th, and then the males had a peak around August 14th, and then the females had a peak around August 28th, and then the population started to drop back down, although at the end of the season, it started to go back up. So then over this graph, I'm gonna show you sort of the parasitoid story at each location. So just to orient you to time, we did the releases on, um, <laughs> July 31st. I'm getting really mixed up with these numbers if you can't tell. July is seven. Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> so we did these releases in July. And then throughout the whole summer, starting before July 31st, we were doing those different methods. So the trapping and the sentinel berries and the wild fruit collections. But we didn't see any parasitoids until October 16th, when we captured 11 of the Leptopelina japonica. And those were found in those monitoring traps. We then detected another Leptolina, Leptolina japonica in the monitoring traps again, and then four more at the end of the season on October 30th. 
So we released Canapsis and then we captured Leptopolina. Looking at the Bodenham location, um, again, mid-July, we started seeing an increase in that population with a first population peak in mid-August, a second in mid-September. And as the season was ending, males were still increasing. Again, to orient you to time, we released on July 31st. And we actually had a pre-release detection of Leptopolina japonica in a wild fruit sample um, on July 17th. Then we captured 41 in another wild fruit collection in mid-August. 11 more Leptopolina from Sentinel blueberries in the beginning of September. At the same time as this peak of spotted wing, two more <laughs> Leptopolina in wild fruit collections in late September. More Leptopolina in early October. And now we were seeing them in the, um, the spotted wing monitoring cups. More and more. So one thing I thought was kind of interesting looking at this graph is that all the pre-October Leptopolina we captured were in wild fruit and sentinel berries. And then after that, we only captured them in the monitoring cups. This is just one site, but it's an interesting observation. I'd be curious if that has something to do with their biology and maybe the different chemical cues that they're looking for at that time of the year. And then at our wells location, uh, we had been hoping to do all three sites of release, but sometimes colony numbers aren't big enough for that. So we didn't release any Gnapsis. No Gnapsis were released at wells this year or any years before it. And then we had one parasitoid detection. And can you guess what it is? It's actually a Gnapsis. So at the two sites we released Gnapsis, we only captured Leptopolina. And the one site we didn't release it, um, we captured seven Gnapsis and Sentinel berries before the release date. Um, and so talking with Phil Fanning and Dave Handley, there has been previous releases in New Hampshire, but that's a really far away for these little teeny parasitoids to travel. Um, so they will be going back. They'll be going back next year and doing some more sampling there just to make sure this wasn't a fluke. Um, you know, it's, it's just really, really interesting. And so I, I kind of was smiling ear to ear as I'm looking through this data because it's a total throwback personally for me to my PhD work. Um, when I started my um, graduate program at Penn State, the brown marmorated stink bug was sort of in this huge explosion where growers were literally in such a bad place that some growers had to rip all their trees out. The stink bug populations were just, just massive, destroying orchards. Um, and they were they had done the same thing where they were trying to figure out what parasitoid to release. And as they were looking at the native populations of parasitoids, they actually found the candidate for release, Trisulcus japonicus. So just for some size, this is some uh, stink bug eggs. And that's a Trisulcus crawling, over, crawling out of this egg mass that it just came out of. Um, and so when I started my degree, um, Trisulcus japonicus had been detected starting in uh, 2014 in Maryland, and then it started expanding and being found in lots of different locations. And I spent a lot of time in a lot of beautiful orchards and put a lot of yellow sticky cards out and found it in all of these different locations in Pennsylvania. These were all operating tree fruit orchards and many of the sites I actually found it right in the middle of the orchards. So that was kind of exciting. Um, and this is sort of a similar graph I made of all the different species of parasitoids I was finding in those eggs um, compared to the stink bug populations over time. So it was neat to, it, it just felt like a nice full circle from things I had done to things I was doing now. All right, we've got 20 more minutes. So let's get through the next project. Um, and I happened to see in the audience, I think I saw Michael Galley and he did he was my summer worker in 2022, who did an amazing job, especially because I was on maternity leave at the time at the beginning of this project. And he did a great job starting that up and just really observational and great job, Mike. Um, so we're going to talk next about Hypena opulentia. So here's the moth and here's the caterpillar as a biocontrol agent of black swallowwort. So a plant. So biocontrol can also be for plants, which is cool. 
So if you haven't heard of black swallowwort, this is an invasive species in 21 states, Ontario and Quebec. It belongs to the dogbane family, so it's a relative of milkweed. And it's really difficult to control mechanically. It has a super persistent rhizome and a super fibrous root. If you want to mechanically control it, there's gotta be a lot of repeated cutting and digging. Swallowwort begins growing in April and then flowering. You can see those flowers here in May or June. Those fruits grow into July and into August. And then the swallowwort can actually self-pollinate, but oftentimes it's pollinated by unspecialized flies like blowflies landing and um, moving plant to plant. And then the seed pods begin to open in September and the plant begins to die back. And so one thing you can see is <laughs> this photo on the left here, it sometimes just completely takes over the undergrowth, um, climbs up the trees and really reduces the diversity of native plants. Um, it competes with native vegetation. It also confuses monarch butterflies and can be toxic to livestock and damage fencing. So really problematic plant. Delving a little more into the butterflies, um, a study was done and they had, they looked at all the different plants where the butterflies had laid eggs. And this field had 77% common milkweed and only 23% black swallowwort, but 15.4% of the monarch eggs were found on black swallowwort. So Maybe it's a visual cue, maybe it's a chemical cue, but something about the swallowwort plant confuses monarchs and they lay their eggs on it. And then the caterpillars hatch and they can't feed on it. So it's really not great. So enter Hypena opulentia. This is a specialist. So this species only feeds on swallowworts. They, I will never have a life cycle. I'm never sure where to begin. Let's start at eggs. <laughs> Um, eggs that are laid hatch after three to four days, and then there are little teeny caterpillars in stars one through three. They're smaller than half an inch, and when they feed on leaves, which you can see um, underneath here on the window painting damage, these little caterpillars can't chew all the way through the leaves. They leave what's called a window pane, but when they get a little bigger, they can, and then they drop down and pupate. They attach to either the underside of the leaves or in the winter will go under the leaves in the soil. And then adults will emerge in the spring and will produce approximately 600 eggs over a 15 day lifespan. So this life cycle typically takes five to six weeks and happens between June and October. And they can overlap and depending on day length and temperature, um, they can be multi-voltine. And so that means multiple generations per season. And when you have a biocontrol, if you can get multiple generations per season, especially on a plant, um, this is great. You get more damage or more stress to that plant. So just a little bit of history on biocontrol of black swallowwort. So black swallowwort was really first, I guess, introduced to the United States in 1864. Um, they were cultivated in greenhouses in Massachusetts. And Mike found this excellent quote in a historical paper where someone was saying, I think that they might be escaping from the botanical gardens and maybe they'll become naturalized. That'd be cool. Um, in 2006, folks went over to Ukraine, the native range of black swallowwort, and they collected hypena on black swallowwort and analyzed it as a potential for a classical biocontrol agent. In 2013, it was approved and first released in Ottawa. Establishment in Ottawa, so a population that's actually established and surviving on its own was confirmed in 2018. In 2017, um, uh, hypena opulentia was first released in the United States in Rhode Island and Massachusetts by Lisa Tewksbury's lab at University of Rhode Island. And then in 2018 and 2021, the first releases happened in Maine and Agunquit by Joan Griswold. And then we did some releases in 2022 and 2023, which I'll be talking about today. So very, very generalized. This is what sort of the release timeline and process looks like for these moths. So in the first year, the first important thing is to choose long sites. So you want sites with a lot of swallowwort that will be left alone. We don't want to release moths that 
then pupate into the soil for someone to come in the next year and rip all the soil out or spray a bunch of herbicides. Um, once we have release sites, we set up cages. And then we receive moths from a rearing facility. We then rear those. Uh, they ship really well as pupa, kind of in vermiculite. And then we put them in cages in the lab and we let them rear to adults. And then we release them into these field cages. I'll have lots of bigger pictures after this slide. Then we'll monitor over the season for evidence of feeding damage. We'll track their life history over time and then try to relate that to the conditions that we release it in to learn more about, did we release it in the best time possible? Are they doing well? And then, you know, we wanna know, did they establish? So we'll go back on the second year and we will look for <clears throat> the adults by doing black light sampling. So if you think of moths and a porch light flying around, um, you can kind of do that on a bigger scale by putting a black light on a sheet in the time frame that moth, the adults are likely flying, which is why it's nice to do this multiple years because you'll learn from year one, okay, we released the adults at this time and they did well, so they'll probably be adults this time next year. And then looking for evidence of decrease over time in black swallow work. So ideally you'd want to revisit these sites year after year and see if that population of swallowwort plants is decreasing over time. So in 2022, we did releases in Harps Well at two sites. And then we went back to a gunkwit where Joan had done releases in 2018 and 2021 to look to see if there was any evidence of establishment. In 2023, we did releases in South Portland at four sites. And then we went back to Harps Well to see if there was any establishment. So first we're gonna talk about the establishment work in a gunkwit. So this is a beautiful old a postcard of Marginal Way. If you've never gone on a walk there, you won't regret it. Um, in 2018, Joan, who was part of the uh, Piscataqua Garden Club, was awarded a grant to the Marginal Way Committee with a goal to reestablish native vegetation. So she's doing so much work to try to get native vegetation back on Marginal Way. And she struggled a lot with swallow work and learned about this project. And she got all the permits and everything approved to release larva into cages. Um, so in the first year, she actually had the larva shipped in the mail. Um, the first shipment, she released 75 into a cage and the second shipment, she released 275. And they really saw minimal leaf damage. And part of that was that there was some mix ups in the mail and many larva didn't seem to be in the best health. And then in 2021, she got these cages and they did two releases where they had adult moths that were released into the cages instead of larva. And they put shade cloths over the cages because they thought maybe part of the reason of the not so successful 2018 project was having to do with the cages that they released into being in like blaring direct sunlight. Um, and they did see some defoliated leaves in cages. So we really wanted to see if there was any establishment. So on July 13th, Mike and I went out and did a really kind of, we, walk, we walked and walked and stopped and did a lot of visual surveys looking at all the swallowwort plants. We stopped at six different locations along the one mile path surrounding those release sites in 2018 and 2021. And we visually surveyed for five minutes each um, looking for any damage, any frass, any holes in the leaves. We just wanted to see if there was any evidence that hypena caterpillars were out and about. Then as we went into the evening, I talked before about this black light sampling. Um, we chose a location that was kind of centralized between all the releases in the past to you know, hope that it would be like where moths would be emerging. While we waited for it to get dark, um, I brought some flyers and it actually turned into a really good educational opportunity. There's a lot of people that walk along Marginal Way. Um, so a lot of people stop and came and talked to us and we handed out this pamphlet. Um, one of the funnier parts of the evening was somebody thought we were doing like a Shakespeare in the park sort of thing. Um, so they were kind of surprised we said we were looking at insects. Um, and then once it started getting dark, we stayed out until 11 p.m. 
looking and looking. Um, and unfortunately, we really didn't see any evidence of establishment. We didn't see any moths during the black light sampling. We didn't see any damage on the leaves. Um, but one positive was that one of the reasons we didn't see damage was we actually were having kind of a hard time finding big patches of swallowwort to look in. And so this is kind of a cool story of a rare opportunity um, since this is such a loved public place to, to visit and walk and enjoy nature. Um, Joan has been doing annual pod picking volunteer days since 2012. She has people who love it and come back year after year to do the pod picking. Um, she has lots of blog posts about these with statistics that they count and weigh the number of pods that they pick. Um, she said in their first years, it was easy to collect almost a thousand pounds of swallowwort. Now they struggle to reach even 500 pounds of these pods. And so I think this is, you know, me mechanical control isn't always feasible for black swallowwort, but this is a case where you have a well-loved public area and lots of people who will show up to volunteer. It seems that the pod picking actually is reducing the population. So I'm really, really proud of her for, you know, taking on this piece of the swallowwort control uh, toolbox and, and making a difference. We did releases in Harpswell as well. And so that year we did two release sites and then two control sites that were selected in the early spring. These cages were erected in the early spring and all of the four sites had a lot of black swallowwort, probably 70% of the leaf cover um, to make sure that there was plenty for the baby hypena to feed on. The sites were also selected so that they had shade. So if you look, we have partial shade over that cage so they're not in the blaring sun. Um, these cages were marked with a sign. So if anybody saw them, they could kind of go up and learn a little bit about the project. And we put this little thing called a tempo disc, kind of looks like a button battery um, in each cage that tracks the um, environmental conditions, including hourly temperature, humidity, dew point, and pressure. They, um, the Lisa Tewksbury's lab, her biocontrol lab at the University of Rhode Island had a big rearing program. So they sent us the pupa in the mail, which we reared. So we received 132 pupa, 60 female and 72 male, and they were reared. Um, they were re reared in these bug dorm containers. Um, we kind of were using what we had. So we had a few different sizes. All four of the, those different containers had a layer of vermiculite covering the bottom with two to three flowering swallowwort plants in them. Oop, I accidentally scrolled through my slides. Sorry about that. And then these cages were just reared basically on the table of our conference room, um, but the temperature was, was good for rearing and we made sure that they weren't in direct sunlight. Then on June 17th, we released those moths in the field. And then, so uh, they were divided over the two cages and sampling methods. We, we were really lucky that Lisa was happy to share all of her protocols. She's been doing this project for years. Um, she shared her sampling methods with us. And we then went back about, about once per week. There was a few weeks that we had to miss, but um, we, we closely monitored these sites starting on July 7th and ending on October um, 4th. And the site visits included a five minute visual survey. So we'd go in, um, we didn't walk too deep in the cage because we didn't want to step on any caterpillars. It's actually hard to see these caterpillars during the day because they're nocturnal. So we would look at the plants and do five minute visual survey. We'd look for any damage on the plants. We'd look at the different um, holes in the leaves. We'd look to see if there was frass, if there was caterpillars. And then we would also survey outside of the cage as well. Um, the purpose of this cage isn't necessarily to keep the moths in, it's to keep the birds out. So it's okay if they escape, uh, the goal is establishment. So this photo here shows the two, uh, two different types of damage that you can see on the leaves. So the larger picture shows window painting damage. And then the smaller picture shows a caterpillar with a full hole damage. And so what's nice about the fact that this caterpillar um, eats more as it gets bigger is you can kind of use that as a proxy to understand 
where we are in the population development. So if you have the window painting, we have more of the little teeny caterpillars, and then the holes means more of the bigger caterpillars. So any caterpillars seen were recorded, um, damage was assigned, um, we did sort of a broad damage rating, so none, no damage on the leaves, low, um, there was holes in a few scattered leaves, etc. And then we also had more of a numerical quantification where we would randomly select and pull off 20 leaves in the cage. And then we would kind of, you know, say how many had window painting, how many had holes, how many had both. Um, and then on top of that, um, you know, we just every week took a photo of the inside of the cage just to sort of see what things looked like over time. Here's a photo of Mike assessing plants on the outside. We had a standardized square size just to kind of quantify things on the outside of the cage as well. So what was really exciting was on August 10th, we actually saw moths, which meant that we released moths into the cage those moths mated, they laid eggs, those eggs hatched, they went through the full instar development, they pupated, and then they emerged as adults. So we actually ended up having a second generation at both of our sites. And on top of that, they ate all of the swallowwort in the cages by um, August 10th at one site and September 29th at the other site. So we followed the protocol. And at that point we removed the cages so that they wouldn't starve. And both of the sites by that time that the cage was taken down had 100% of the leaves um, damaged within the cage. So this photo here shows there's other plants, but there's no swallowwort left. Um, these are some pupa, um, not loving seeing a huge spider right next to the pupa. Um, and then this is a leaf that was almost entirely consumed. This shows the different sites over time. So at the start, the middle and the end of the season. Okay, so then did they survive the winter? Well, we wanted to make sure that first of all, they survived us humans. So at each of the sites, we um, made sort of more sturdy signs. Um, I We laminated this over a piece of metal um, saying that this was the site of a 2022 release. Please don't, um, <laughs> please don't pull up any of the swallowwort or mow here. And we <clears throat> went back to those sites and looked um, on a weekly basis from June 21st through the end of the season. And we looked at the site center, um, 50 feet, 100 feet, and 200 feet from that center with five or 10, 10 to five minute visuals. Um, we did more time concentrated, kind of closer to the cage. Um, and things were a little bit perplexing um, at the beginning when we went. We saw holes and got really excited, but you have to always remember some of these holes could be mechanical damage. We saw some slugs and snails on the swallowwort plants. Um, we were excited to see what looked like window painting and maybe even an egg. I know that's kind of hard to see, but it really looks like a swallowwort egg. But things started to get really confusing as the season went on. Um, these didn't look like what the leaves looked like the year prior, and it was a really wet year. And we were starting to suspect that this might be a pathogen. So we collected some leaves and sent them up to the lab at, the, at UMaine, uh, Dr. Allison Smart. And she diagnosed that those black swallowwort actually had angular leaf spot. So it we didn't see any caterpillars, there was this disease going on. And so I'm not so sure that looking at leaf damage is the best way to determine establishment. Although I do have some cool news. So we did our black light sampling in Harpswell. And on um, <clears throat> June 15th at one of our locations, as we are standing there all night looking at the sheet, I pretty much jumped for joy because we actually saw Hypena. Um, that was really exciting, just for some comparison. This is what I found on the sheet, and that's from the releases the year prior. Um, I still have to pin and identify the species, but doing some preliminary ID, it, it is pretty, it is Hypena. Um, so I did bring it back to the lab before freezing and um, saving it as a voucher specimen and making sure it's actually the species. I put it in a little cage with everything it would need just to see if it would lay eggs. You can't really tell if it's a male or a female without dissection. 
um, no eggs were laid and it eventually died. So, um, but anyhow, this was, this was really exciting. So a little bit of evidence of establishment. All right, I'm gonna have to fly through these releases in South Portland this year. So in South Portland this year, it was really cool to pick the sites because I got to collaborate with the South Portland Parks and Rec Department. Um, and in 2018, they had actually had all of their parks assessed for invasive plants. So we got to kind of sit at the computer and look through that data and decide which might be good sites. And it's really nice to kind of look at those sites and have five or six or seven different options to go to. Um, this is one of my locations. and. Um, there was quite a bit of swallow wart and, you know, we were able to kind of set our cage up. You can kind of see the top of it um, next to that wall. But, you know, it, it was just great to have all these different options and have the data. One of the sites was actually at an elementary school, so it also was a really nice opportunity to do some education. Um, I made a handout for the kids. And it was actually, we set the cage up on their last day of school. So they <clears throat> gave us the time of like when they had recess. And so every like 20 minutes, a new horde of kids would come running over and super, super excited to learn about the project. It was really cute. Um, th then um, as per the last year, we received our pupa. Um, the Tewksbury lab actually gave all the, I guess, the colony and the protocols to the Philip Ilanthi Beneficial Insect Rearing Laboratory, which they, they rear lots of different insects. Actually, during my PhD, I bought stink bugs and stink bug eggs from them. So I was actually familiar with the person that um, sent these to me. Um, we reared them in, I got some new cages to rear them in, in the lab. And then we had two different sets that we released out in the field. Um, when I released them, I looked to see the plants in the rearing cages. You know, they all had eggs, so they had mated and they were ready to go. Any pupa that didn't emerge into adults, I deployed in delta traps. I liked the idea from the other project. Like, oh, that's a great idea. So I released those as well, just gave them one last chance to emerge. Same as the previous year, we took pictures and we quantified the damage. One thing I did this year was, um, use Survey123, which is sort of an, an app that you can build a form in for field work. And I had those 20 leaves that were gathered kind of placed out with a photo. I'm thinking about this being maybe something I can include citizen science in. So I wanted to try it out this year to see how it went. And it's really nice to be able to go back through those photos and just look at what that damage looked like. As the previous year, we got a second generation at three of the four sites we saw moths um, anywhere from August 9th through August 16th. This is one of the sites at the end of the season. You can see sort of these vines that were swallowwort plants really decimated. And the new locations also seemed to have that same disease. And so looking forward, we're gonna hope to keep doing this project. Um, the funding application is open now, so I'm gonna apply to do it again next year. Um, what's great is that um, this initially was applied for with the person who had my role before and the person who was the invasive plant biologist, which moved on to another position. So we recently um, now have a new invasive plant biologist again. So he's going to be working with me on this project. And I have all these question marks all over the state of Maine because as I started thinking about this project, it became a little overwhelming. I'm like, Oh my gosh, I have Harpswell, I have South Portland, something this year. Now I have two establishment sites, I'm going to have three establishment sites. What do I do? Like, how, how am I going to get to all these? So this is where I'd like to start trying to include some citizen science. I think I can pick sites, set up the cages and release them off. And then I think folks that are willing to volunteer could maybe check on those cages and meet with me once per week or, you know, look over the data together. So i um, thinking that's going to be cool. I used some funding to build sort of field kits for this idea, and I'm inspired by the main Audubon Stream Explorers program. And then just one last slide, bringing it full circle. Um, it felt really cool to be releasing a caterpillar as a biocontrol for an invasive plant next to sites that back in 2013, when I was an undergrad at UMaine, I got to help release a fly as a biocontrol for an invasive caterpillar. So 
I don't know. Sometimes I think the universe just gives you a big smile. So obviously I couldn't do this work without so much help. Um, I have so many different folks to thank here and I really appreciate the time you took to listen tonight. So thank you so much. That was, that was awesome, Hillary. That was a really interesting and great uh, photography throughout. Appreciate that. So um, you're you. busy, busy, obviously. Um, I don't see any questions in the chat. I've, I've got a few. If people want to write some in, that's great. But um, you really focused on a couple of efforts. Um, are there a bunch more biocontrol efforts going on in the state? I, I know at one point, some things from parasitoids were released for... Um, for blue strife, you just mentioned something in the past as well. Um, are there other active projects going now? There are. Um, there are still releases going on for winter moth of that fly. And there are other projects, although right now I'm totally blanking and now I'm kind of bumming because I, I was thinking about making a slide and having a bunch of those different ones lined up. Um, mm -hmm. If you want to learn more, I will make a plug. Um, April 11th is the Maine Invasive Species Network meeting. The registration is up for that, although it will be closing, I think, on March 26th. If you just Google Maine Invasive Species Network, you can find that. Um, and there'll be some talks on biocontrol at that and other invasive species. It's going to be up at UMaine, helping, helping plan it. So I'm always happy to, to have a plug for that. Well, and, and Gary, Gary just put a few into the chat there, purple loose drive, uh... Winter moth, you said eastern ash borer, uh, I'm HWA, I'm not sure what that is. Hem uh, hemlock woolly adelgid, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. thanks, Gary. I go get the adelgid, yep. Yeah. Right. So, so have, has, has the loose strife ever been, effort been successful, you know? Anyone know? Anyone? Anyone? Gary? Um, oh, yeah, yeah well, so the purple loose strife releases have been um, quite successful. And there are efforts to raise them at the the um, Rachel Carson Wild, National okay. Wildlife Refuge, but um, they're they're not as active in terms of producing them at this point. Uh, the Gala Rosella beetles, mm -hmm. but they can be uh, really um, impactful. Okay. Anything out there for uh, knotweed, for example? Thinking of invasives around around here. Not with the big one, and, and I'm and I'm doing the blank now. What's the woody uh, woody shrub in the wood? You know, woody shrub in the woods. Yeah, um, you know, very common invasive. Um, so they have been releasing uh, an adelgid, I believe it is, for um, knotweed. It doesn't really work on the knotweed that we have. It seems to work oh. on giant knotweed better than Japanese knotweed. Japanese. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um. Any sense of, well, some more chats here. Let me see who's, oh, someone asking about honeysuckle. That's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Right. Anything? Yeah. Nothing that I know of for honeysuckle. Okay. Anything mm -hmm. else there? Nothing I'm saying. Um, do you, someone asking, Pam asking, do you know of any projects to release hypena in, uh, in Massachusetts? I, I don't, I don't think so, but I, I am not a hundred percent sure, but I, I don't think so. What's, what is the range of the swallowtail in Maine? It looked in that initial map that it was kind of Southern Maine, but then I thought I heard you talking about doing some releases further North as well. Yeah. I'm also, I'm also not super familiar with that. And I will go back a couple slides, you know, I, I'm still learning my plants as a as a trained entomologist, but um, really excited that Chad Hammer, Chad Hammer, our new invasive plant biologist, will be a part of this moving forward. Because one thing I haven't been able to do as well as I would like to is quantify the other plants that are around this fallowwort um, mm -hmm. and the populations of those, so that over time I can know, you know, when there are changes, what what takes over, what was gone, what comes back, things like that. Um. Some great pictures of the different leaf damage, you know, holes in the leaf. At, at what is there any kind of a rule of thumb as to at what point um, of what point of leaf damage is unrecoverable from? That can be that's going to be totally dependent on species, probably in time of year. I'm going to guess. 
Um, yeah, and I, I think with the swallowwort, it can take a couple years of 100% defoliation before the populations will begin to die back. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not and I will note, you know, I didn't, I, I didn't have enough time to cover everything in as depth as I'd like to, but I, I recently yeah. attended part of a webinar of a bunch of different states giving updates on this, and I think it's free online. Maybe I can find it and send it, but um, it, it has been challenging. It hasn't been, this hypena has not done an amazing job establishing. You know, one of the potential issues is that those pupa that are in the ground, like, get fed on by, mm -hmm. like, mice and, and, you know, moles and things like that. Um, and I think, and there's a couple other biocontrols they're starting to look at as well. So um, we'll see if this is successful or not. And Gary posted a range map for swallow work, which is a little hard to see because it's tiny and there's probably a way to make it bigger, but it looks pretty, uh, pretty widespread. Is that, that, that accurate assessment, Gary? Yeah, I mean, I don't think that that map is necessarily showing where it already is, but it's the expected range at okay. least. Uh, yeah, so it it's not um, it's not very limited in terms of winter or anything like that. Am I remembering correctly that Kudzo is also spreading a lot moving north? It's into Massachusetts now. Holy cow! Yeah. I just posted the link of that. It's the Eastern Lake Ontario Swallowwort Collaborative. So they gave an update. A bunch of different states gave updates on their efforts. Thank you. Um, I, I think lastly for me, you mentioned at the end, you know, citizen science and monitoring. It, it you know, we've had a, a water quality monitoring program for you know twenty years or so, and I I, I do think that you would find much success with, um, you know, reaching out to groups like ours or Audubon or whoever. And you yeah. know, a, lot, a lot of people do want to get involved. And, and, uh, Definitely. Yeah. And, you, 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 this... may find, you may find you have more, more monitors than you can wrangle. <laughs> that would be great. This, this cage that I have as my background was um, on the path, a path on SMCC campus. Mm -hmm. And I always knew that I needed to spend a little extra time on that site because somebody would come while I'm standing in the cage and have like a really long conversation. So people were definitely invested in, you know, they'd read the sign and they'd be like, oh, I've been looking and seeing. And so, you know, that was great. Yeah, and as you know, the state has a number of, or has had a number of <clears throat> various wildlife and, and plant atlas survey things and citizens take part. And, and I'm not sure all of them are still going. I don't think they are. So there, there may be some more people out there that are, um, you know, anxious to get out and, and, and contribute in, in some way. So and that, would, that would be good. Great. Well, I don't have anything else. I don't see any more questions here. So I think I'll just thank you again. I, I'll, I'll put in a, one more plug. <clears throat> and, and again, Brain Cramp, um, probably a lot of the people on this, on this program have read Ed Young's recent book, um, An, immense, uh, An Immense World or Immense Journey. Um, but it's a celebration of animal senses, you know, sight, hearing, touch, electromagnetic uh, stuff. And there's a lot in there about insects. And it's a really fascinating and wonderful book. And I recommend it heartily to everyone. Pick it up at the bookstore. Or you can pick it up used via, you know, internet, whatever. Yeah. What was it called again? Oh, something you had to ask. Um, if, if you type in <laughs> Ed Young, Y-O-N-G, an immense... And I forget, I think it's world or journey or something at the end. I, I, I'm blanking out, but it'll it'll come up. Great. It's a Pulitzer Prize winner. You know, he's he's just a really good writer. And it's um yeah, it's not something that a lot of us think about all that much. And uh, you know, how does that hyphena get along? How does it find its prey? You know, is it is it smell, is it touch, is it uh, you know, electrical fields? Um and he travels through, um, you know, bugs, mammals, um, plants, undersea, um, marine critters, you know. Yeah, it's really that's great. Great. 
chemical ecology, which is how insects, uh, they, they do a lot of their sensory is the smelling is how they find things is one of my favorite areas in entomology. And I, I did a chapter of my dissertation on trying to think about how the parasitoids found those tiny little stink bug eggs and did a lot of reading. And I ran an experiment. So plants can actually respond to, you know, insects feeding on them and things like that. But plants can even respond to the glue that stink bugs like would use to lay the egg on the plant. So I collected volatiles from plants where I had stink bugs laying eggs. And I saw that the volatile compounds changed quite a bit when they had eggs laid on them. So that might have something to do with how the parasitoids find them. It's so interesting. Yeah, well, and and today on the radio is kind of interesting because I, I I just finished the book uh, last night or this morning, and on the radio today there was a piece about um, science scientists just you know, published a paper on the effects of playing um, coral music, the sounds of coral reefs, healthy coral reefs, um, doing or at um, uh, bringing coral. Uh, baby coral pupa or whatever they're called polyps back to burnt out hmm. reefs interesting and so playing the underwater playing the sounds of healthy reefs underwater would was definitely improving the uh, recolonization rate for dead areas and that's something that i just read about in ed's book interesting that's really that's cool part of it. so that's, that's pretty cool yeah so great well thank you um uh oh, there's something about here i see uh, Oh, an immense world. Thank you, Pam. Yeah. Well, I also like The Mind of a Bee by Lars Chitka. Um, Gary has a little thing here about hornworms. I'm not sure. Common from Canada to Mexico, cousins of the tobacco worm. They are often parasitized by a wasp, which is also parasitized by a fly. You find them and hand pick them. Yeah. Cool. Great. Well, thank you again very much, uh, Hillary and Martin. Everyone else for coming uh, should be posted in a few days, so you can pass the pass the link on. Um, and hope some of you join us for Bald Eagles in a month. Our, our series is on the second Wednesday of each month, October through May. Um, thanks again. Thank you so much for the opportunity.